uh, welcome to the Back to Basics uh, Exception and Event Instrumentation in .NET. I'm David McCarter. I'm an MVP at uh, Microsoft. Um, I also have a coding standard book out. And I also have an online, uh, an open source project called uh, uh, .NET Tips, which is up on, it's on the section .NET Tips up on Coplex.com. This has uh, all the common code I've been writing ever since, about since a year before .NET even came out. So here's what we're going to talk about today. I actually cut out the first demo because we're starting a little bit late and just to get uh, through everything on time. Uh, so we're going to talk about login and ex exceptions and events in .NET. We're going to talk just very brief, briefly about .NET trace listeners because uh, I really don't use those. And then we're going to talk about custom trace listeners, which I do use, and also all the trace listeners that I have uh, already in my .NET tips uh, .utility, which is what a lot of this is based around on, because I fixed all the .NET stuff. <laughs> and then uh, the last thing is what I call my centralized exception and logging handling system. I'll show you that real quick. And this is actually uh, a version of this. Uh, this version, um, I actually have this on all the code and everything on little USB keys. So if you really want it, because I have a limited number, you can take it when you leave. So logging exceptions and events. So why do we need to log exceptions, especially exceptions? Exceptions are the most important, but also events too. Why do we need to do this? Right. Mostly for debugging, trying, trying to figure out what's wrong. Exactly. That's number one reason, really. Anything else? Right. You can reconstruct the issues uh, with uh, looking at what's been transpiring in the logs. Right. Exactly. Users lie. Well, <laughs> what? Well, it's not that they lie. Is that you? I, yeah, yeah. What were you doing? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So actually, I'll tell you a quick little story. So a couple of weeks ago, I was in Kansas at one of our uh, our big partners, my company, and uh, and they were using the program, and we actually went into like the corporate store, you know. And uh, so, because we just wanted to talk to real users. The first time I actually saw a real user of my product, you know. And uh, so we went there and I asked, uh, one the guy I was with talked to the other guy. I talked to another guy who basically was just the parts ordering person at an auto repair shop because my company does all automotive repair things. And uh, I said, so how do you like the program? He goes, yeah, it's okay. Uh, it's too slow. And I go, yeah, I know. He goes, but it like crashes five times a day. I go, what? He goes, yeah. I go, oh, okay. What were you doing? Is it like the same thing you're doing every time? He goes, I don't, I don't know. I think, I don't know. It's different things. I'm going, okay. That helps me a lot. So I went out in the lobby, and he comes in there, and he, he taps me on my shoulder and goes, hey, it just crashed. You want to come look at it? <laughs> <laughs> and because, uh, of course. I'm trying to do the company thing and, you know, make everybody happy. So I went over and he left the message up, which of course is just a generic blah, 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 something happened, call tech support, right? And at that point, when you get to that point in our program, you have to reboot it, right? It's gone at that point. So I went, okay, and I clicked okay, and I noticed what screen he was using. And then I went and I know where the file is that I'm gonna basically be showing you here, the XML file we um, output to every user's machine. And I went there and I brought up Google Gmail and I sent it to myself and now we have it at work and now we're going to look into, uh, this month we're going to look into what was causing that problem because we're trying to get our new version out. But that right there was perfect. And actually what happens at our company is that uh, usually those people call tech support, you know, and tech support will get on their machines and do the same thing. So it's really important for those situations, right? to log what's going on in your computer, right? How about events? Any other reasons you guys, who does logging now? Hopefully most everybody have. The big reason is debugging statements only work in, in the debug builds, right? Once we uh, do a release build, then they're all gone. So we need a better way to track these things. Um, no way to tell what the application is doing during runtime, right? Like I, I usually say, it all works on my machine, right? Works perfect. Nothing ever happens on my machine. As soon as you get it out somewhere, especially on production servers, those are the worst. Then the stuff starts happening. So while they're running, is really, really important to find out what's what's going on. 
And of course, we were just talking about this. You need to log exceptions for evaluation by support and development teams, right? Hopefully, you're all those of you who are doing it are all doing this. And like someone else was saying, you need to log other information, you know, just things, ha other things happening in your program, just not exceptions, right? I even log on our web servers every time the ser every time the application's coming up and down, right? We actually use this logging system at work to log other things like um, users' uh, machine information. You know, so we can tell in the back, you know, back at you know San Diego, what kind of computers the users are ha have, what how much memory they have, stuff like that. It really helps us plan things and really know what's going on in the users. I'm even logging their uh, screen resolution now. So because one of the graphic artists. Uh, we have, I work at the first place ever that we have a, actually a UX team, user experience team. So they were interested on how big the screens are people are using, so I added that to the logging system. And then we also use it for reporting, so we actually do analytics and things like that on what's going on, at, not only at our customers, but also on their backend servers. So we can try to evaluate what places we need to fix or enhance, to make better, things like that. Um, so what logging mechanisms do you guys use now? Enterprise library. Enterprise, so you use enterprise library, okay. What else? Database. Database. That's a good place. Log to the event log. You should always do this, right? Especially because the system administrators like reading this. If, if only a backup of whatever mechanism you do, you should be logging to the event log, right? It's free, it's, it's easy, and uh, they go in there really fast. Custom text files, I've actually heard people tell me this, they use custom text files, I'm not a really big proponent of that. Uh, I really like XML, which we're going to talk about, because text files are hard to like bring into another program, right? Um, custom XML files, who does this? Does anybody do logging to XML? One person, okay. I like this the best because it's really transportable, you can easily, you know, using link and XDoc and things like that, suck it into other programs or databases. Somebody was talking about a database, right? Um, use the database. We actually use that too. And uh, all kinds of other ways. The .NET solution, which I think came out in .NET 2, I don't think it was there in the early days, is called uh, Trace Listeners. Who, use the, who uses these? Uh, they're easy to use from any .NET application, including ASP.NET. I make that an em emphasis here, because if you write your roll your own logging right to a file or something like that, guess what happens when you try to use it in an ASP.NET application? It won't log unless you give it elevated permissions and things like that, because most users are coming in as anonymous, right? You have problems with uh, these other systems, not only if it's ASP.NET, but let's say for some reason you're logging to a place in in, in the com user's computer that they don't have it access to, right? Because, you know, you usually run your machine as admin, right? Guess what? Your users hopefully aren't. And you can run into problems logging into certain areas of the computer because they don't have access to it. So the .NET trace listeners will work. Um, they're really, really configurable, as I'm going to be showing you throughout uh, all my custom things. And, uh, and the most, what I'm going to be showing you is... Uh, it's really easy to write your own trace listeners by inheriting the base class, right? And that's what I do. I don't use really any of the .NET trace listeners except for the event logging. So let's just talk really briefly about the .NET trace listeners. Well, trace listening or instrumentation, basically. Uh, write information messages about the execution of the application at runtime, right? I think we all got that. So there's a couple phases. There's the instrumentation phase, which is this is where you trace your app, trace your code in your application, all the places that causes exceptions or where you want to log things happening in your computer. This is the instrumentation phase, and then the next phase is actually tracing, which is writes the trace uh, information to specific targets. Right? Some are using files, some are using a page, some are using database. Right? That's the tracing mechanism. I mean, the tracing phase as your program's running. And then, of course, hopefully, uh, which we, I admittedly, we don't even do good enough because, of course, time issues, is analysis, right? 
hopefully you're, you're looking at those logs and seeing what's going on, even if the user's not calling up and screaming at you, your program's not, using, not working, right? So um, the way you write is uh, you actually write to the, any one of the trace listeners and the trace listeners collection, which we'll talk a little bit about that when I uh, show you the uh, configuration file. And uh, you can do asserts, fails, writes, write if, write line, and write line if. Really common uh, methods. The one I use, of course, is uh, just write line. And this will write a line into the tracing. And also other things. You can actually write exceptions into the tracing, too. So these are the out-of-the-box uh, .NET trace listeners. Um, there's the text writer, uh, which just writes to a, a text, uh, writes to the text writer or a stream class. I've never really used this because I'm not, I don't like the flat files. Of course, there's the event log trace listener writes to the event log and even works in ASP.NET. Okay? So this, like I said, especially if you have, who has the servers? You have all the servers on your back end. So even if you're logging your mechanism, you should still use the event log trace listener as a backup. There's the default trace listener, of course, which goes out to the, um, uh, the output uh, debug string or the debugger log. Uh, this is actually, if you use this, if you don't turn this off because it kind of comes on automatically in your application, uh, it'll log to the debug window while you're debugging your app in Visual Studio. There's the console trace listener, which I'm not really sure of any good use of this, because unless you're going to look at the console on a server or on your user's machine, I guess it doesn't work very well. So I don't use this one either. You can do a delimited trace listener, uh, writes to a, a delimited text format. And the one I like the most besides the uh, event log trace listener is the XML uh, trace listener. This writes a full uh, XML um, strings into a log file for you. And this is what you can easily suck into other programs, have it sent other places, go on a file share, whatever you feel like doing to uh, see what's going on. As I told you in my story at the beginning, that's what we log every user's machine throughout the United States is uh, we log that. The configuration, which I'll show you in my next demo, because I'm going to skip the first demo because of time, uh, is you can do mostly, we do all of our configuration for the listeners through uh, the app config or the web config file. It's very, very easy to do that. I've actually written some code that... Um, that we can actually do it during run, we can actually turn things off during runtime. So you can actually set, you know, create trace listeners and get rid of them during runtime too. But usually we create trace listeners with the config files because they're really easy to config. And, uh, and then we can turn them off in code if we, if we have one trace listener doing something bad or spamming our backend systems really bad, we have a website we can go to and turn them off. So it's really easy to do that. What I really want to talk to spend most of our time talking today is the custom trace listeners that, as you're going to see, um, you can add functionality to the current trace listeners or even just create your own. If you want to create your own trace listeners, uh, you just, of course, inherit the trace listener class. It's really easy. And then you can overwrite uh, the write, uh, which uh, writes specified messages to the listener. Uh, the write line writes messages to the listener. And trace event, which is where most of the code will actually go, I'll show you. Um, this writes uh, the actual data blobs to whatever trace listener mechanism that you have set up. And it's very configurable. As, and I'll, if I have time, I'll get to show you more about that. Um, you can also override the trace data and get supported attributes. So the cool thing is out of the box, uh, the trace listeners don't really have a lot of configuration you can do in the web config and the app config, right? Uh, all the default .NET trace listeners only has one parameter that you can put something in, and, each, and it means something different with every other trace listener. So the cool thing um, with get supported attributes is you can actually add any parameter you want, and I'll show you in the config, to your trace listener. So the first one I rewrote uh, when I started doing this a long time ago was the XML trace listener. And the reason I did it was um, the XML tracer does not write well-formed XML. You know, my boss were, was bugging me. I can't bring this up in XML Spy or in an Explorer. It doesn't know what it is because it doesn't. It's not well-formed. Basically, it didn't have the root elements, right? And uh, 
So that's not very good. You have to actually specific, specifically pick a program to look at it. Uh, the other bad thing about the XML trace listener, it creates one huge file, right? So I'll tell you a really quick story. One time in my last company, um, you know, I, I implemented the trace listeners, and about a month later, I get a call from our, our manufacturing plant in Austin. And I said, Dave, this application is running really slow. And I go, hmm, nothing's changed. We haven't changed servers. Nothing should be causing the slowness. You know, I ran the program. It was running slow. I looked at everything. I could not figure out why, right? Then I just happened to stumble upon the file location where I was saving those XML files, and it was freaking huge. Why? Because a month before, they called me and said, hey, Dave, there's something going on with the program. Can you look at it? And what I do on, on servers sometimes is I leave this off. I don't turn it on unless something's going on, right? So I went in, I turned it on, I called, I talked to the user, and I told the user, uh, do what you were doing when it did that. And they did it, and it, I saw the file, and I go, oh, I know exactly what the problem is, I'll fix it right now, right? Except I forgot to turn that file creation off. So a month later, everything was slowing, it was slow as a dog, right? So it creates one huge file, and uh, it's not good. And uh, also with ASP.NET and maybe other applications, it actually uh, locks it. So if you did want to delete it or copy it or something like that, uh, you can't because it's locked by IS. So, um, and, some, and sometimes because of flushing issues, the latest trace won't be in the file either. So... This is the first one I rewrote, basically because of all these reasons, right? This, to me, it's almost useless in the real world. Um, so let's talk about all the trace listeners I've written. Um, and this is taking exception handling to the extreme, as you'll see at some of the demo, uh, some of the, the data I'm logging. So uh, there are all these trace listeners I'm telling you about are, are part of my uh, uh, assembly up on CodePlex. You can get it up there on .NET Tips. Um, the latest version I have public is the 3.5 version. If you really want the 4.0 version that I haven't completely tested, please email me. I'll be happy to send it to you. Okay? But the latest version up there is for .NET 3.5. It fixes, enhances um, all the trade .NET trace listeners that I use that you'll see here in a minute. Adds new trace listeners that we use at work all the time. And uh, that's the cool thing about inheriting, creating your own. And I output a ton more debugging information that the, the .NET trace listeners uh, don't do, which is really, really useful. And believe me, it has saved us countless hours at work finding issues and fixing them quickly, especially during the last phases of our beta tests and things like that, because you know time is like, like that, right? You can't miss the date. Um, and also, I allow to log custom information, just not the, inform just not the information uh, that comes out of the box. And I have some built-in configuration things, too. Before we get to the actual trace listeners, um, this is some of the things I've done to enhance the trace listener object itself. And, and most of this, of course, uh, comes into play when you're debugging. So for me, the more info I can gain out of the, the box and the program, is my job's going to be a lot easier debugging. Do you guys agree? Yeah. So um, I log uh, thread and process information, like the thread ID, process name, things like that. Um, I'll show you that when you get to the demo. The domain name that um, it's coming from, the application information, um, which is all kinds of application information, including uh, you know, how much uh, memory the application's using and all those kind of things. Um, user information, so I actually log, log the logged on user and things like that. Tons of computer information, including memory, what version of, um, you know, uh, .NET is being used, what version of Windows is being used, all that stuff is being logged. Oh, I also automatically log the class name and the method name that the exception occurred in, uh, so you don't have to worry about that or add that in any other, in any way. Because I felt, I kept doing that in my older version, 
I kept logging what method I was in, you know, when it happened down in my exception handling. And I said, this is, I'm tired of doing this all the time. So I just wrote it into it. It does it automatically for you now. Uh, one thing with this system that I always forget to tell people is completely multi-threaded now. Um, I'm not sure if that version that I have up on there is, but definitely the 4.0 version is multi-threaded. So it will not slow down your program. It, it, it logs it and your program keeps going. There's no slowdown in your program at all. I have a custom collection uh, called um, additional information, which you can log anything you want in here. This is kind of the way you can do your custom information. And I automatically log things like, um, I actually have a category built in. So uh, exceptions don't have a, a category. They're either information or critical or error and things like that. But we're using categories at work to, to basically do analytics on the data that we're getting back, right? And uh, we're also using categories at work. Uh, for, ex for example, they came to me uh, before the release of our first version last year. And they said, well, Dave, we want to know every report is, that is actually run on the application. Because we, don't, we have hundreds of reports, and we want to translate them all into uh, uh, SQL reporting services, because they're currently in Crystal. <laughs> and so they, we, but we don't want to do every one, right? We want to do the ones people are using. So I actually created a new category, and we actually log that to the back end. And then we do reporting on that all the time to find out which reports we do. Also, that's actually where we, what we use the category for uh, every time a user logs into our application, we send, it, we send all their information, including computer, what computer they're running, and memory, and all that stuff I told you earlier about. Every time they log in, we send it extra our backend systems in San Diego, and, and we keep that for uh, analytics. Um, I have a custom ID that I add to it, so you can identify it easily in databases and things like that. Um, the user machine name, I uh, use the severity um, source and also the source version. So basically your .NET assembly information. Uh, the first, some seats up here. The first one I did was the event log uh, trace listener, just so it works really well with the um, event entry class that I showed you before, um, the log entry class. Of course, I, I did the XML trace listener was my first one. I fixed all the issues with the XML trace listener, every single one. And it writes well-formed XML. <laughs> it does not lock the file. And it creates a new file each day. So dude, there's no way you can have these big files anymore, right? Because every day after midnight, the first time it's hit, it creates a new file, right? And it's completely configurable how many of these you keep. So if you configure it to keep five of those files, then as soon as it gets up to six, it deletes the old one. And this is kind of an example of one of our backend servers. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be showing this, but oh well. So here we have uh, um, some backup files, and here's the current running uh, error log, the, the exception event log file that we're doing on one of our backend servers. I added an email trace listener, which of course uses my specific class to email, makes these really nice emails with everything uh, nice for you to look at. And emails it. So what I what, uh, e emails any event or exception. So do you want to get all of them sent to you? No. So what we what we have been what I've implemented in our program is that only the ones that are more critical get sent to it. So, and that's actually not using anything within my trace listener. It's actually part of the trace listener configuration where you can actually do these things called filters. So you can filter on like uh, the, uh, uh, the, whatever, the exception and stuff. What's it called? Severity. There you go. You can filter on severity, and only those will go to the trace listener. So for the email one, we only we filter on uh, critical. Because to me, and that gets emailed to us. So if it gets that far, uh, we want to know right away so we can be proactive in uh, fixing things, or at least knowing what is going on when a customer calls and starts yelling at us. The other big one besides the XML trace listener, is the web service trace listener. So this is how we get data from our clients or our servers or anywhere to one location. So we can log it in a database. You're using data, no, who's using databases? You were? So this is how we do it with the web service trace listener. So the cool thing with this, it works on any customer site because most people can go out through port 80 and it is really good as doing the next section of this talk, which is the centralized error logging system. Okay. 
And the one I have, but I haven't tested enough in live situations yet, is the TCP trace listener. So the reason I came up with this was actually towards the end of, of uh, QA or last version of our program. And I, want, I saw the QA people, every time something happened, you know, before they send us a ticket, they go and look at the, um, the log, the XML log. Well, number one, a lot of them are good at looking at XML. And number two, that was just more work I thought that they needed to do, right, to make it easier on the QA people. I want to make everybody's life easy, right? So I, I did the TCP trace listener. So the cool thing with this is as soon as anything is happening, it pops up in the program I wrote. So they can attach to any server they're using, and bam, everything is coming up, and you can immediately see what's coming, going on. It's live trace listening, right? So it's pretty cool. But it's not in my program. It's not, I haven't tested enough yet, so it's not out yet. So I have a class called LogWriter. This is what's responsible for um, logging exceptions and events to uh, using the log entry uh, class that I wrote. Um, even if you, uh, if you log events, it still uses log entry under the hood, so I can add more information to it. And uh, it writes to the uh, correct log uh, collection based on the type of application. So not that you guys really want to know, but if you're an ASP.NET or anything else, there's two different um, logging mechanisms. There's one for ASP.NET, one for everything else. So my, my uh, code detects which application you're running and logs to the correct collection. And the main two methods you use is a write entry, uh, which this is mainly just for writing uh, events. And then, of course, write exception, which uh, writes all the exception information. And like I said, it's multi-threaded. So as soon as you, you use any of those methods, it goes into a thread pool and gets processed as soon as it can. Let's look at the code. So first, I'm just going to show you how you use this system. And then I'll run it. Um, because I added some pretty cool things that you can do. So here's actually you log how you log an event. Everybody see it okay? So you just do a write entry, and I'm just creating a string right here and saying event test now, and I'm setting the uh, type to information. And here's how I write an exception. I'm not trapping an exception, so I'm faking it. So um, I'm creating a new argument null exception, which is a very common exception you use when you're uh, checking parameters. Those of you who came to my last talk, and I'm setting it to error, of course, because this isn't an error because it's an exception. I am setting in the method name, which I don't need to do anymore. Uh, but I can, this is uh, basically, uh, you can, there's one parameter here that allows you to do additional information. So if you want to add something here to the exception logging, like exactly what the code was doing when this happened and things like that, you can add it there. And then, uh, and then the other thing, which I'm going to show you, is something I kept seeing at work, um, especially when I started there, is uh, where we had exceptions happening and it, we throwed it back up to the user, guess what they were looking at? Well, they saw the .NET error message. No, no, not the big error page, but if you do exception.message, that's what we were showing the users. Is that a good idea? Of course not. It's the worst thing you can do. Number one, most of them don't make any sense anyway. Right? But do you think they make sense to any user? No. Never, never do that, please. So anyway, so, uh, so what I did is I have a, another uh, parameter here called uh, user uh, pop-up message. So on the same line, you can log it, and it will pop up a hu human-readable message that you put in here, not a programmer message, right? And uh, a non-geek message, right? that you can pop up to your user. And I'll show you in the demo of this. And um, so that's how you do it. That's how you log it. It's really easy. So I'll show you this first demo real quick so I can show you the uh, pop-up. So we're going to do this. And it's going to come up with that user message here in a second. Once everything compiles, there. Something really bad happened. Okay? And uh, just to show you really quick, um, that same code works in ASP.NET. That's how we write it. If we want to look at what that gets output, is this right here. So I would do this. Uh, full screen. So uh, most of the information up here is the normal things that are getting logged by 
uh, the trace listener system itself, not my stuff, right? Um, except I did add this right here because our, our, uh, I was logging UTC because that's what time you should be using, but our QA people didn't like that, so <laughs> I added the actual time right here, so it's easier for them to read. But what's the uh, magic down here is what's being um, actually logged in what we call the data entry item, which is still part of the .NET trace listeners. So here's my log entry class, right? And here I have my unique ID, um, I have my timestamp information, none category, my, the user, the message that I wrote right there, and on some additional information, which is machine name and the source. So here's the actual error. So same type of information up here, but down here is where all the, uh, the goodness is, I guess. So we have the normal things. Here's the message. And here's the error messages. And if there's more, there'd be mul multiple uh, message um, elements here. So it logs the, the uh, uh, error message right here. And then we have our application information, which we saw before. But here's all the other stuff I log, uh, uh, like the CLR version, map memory, domain name, application domain name, culture, free physical memory stuff, OS information, uh, uh, other memory information, process ID, uh, the actual name of the process, meaning the, the executable, uh, the thread ID, uh, the user domain, if the user is interactive or not, all this information. Okay? So this is all the additional things. I'm even logging more now with my .NET 4 version. I'm logging, like I said, I'm logging the, uh, the size of their screen. I'm also logging how many cores they have in their processor and <laughs> I really want to get everything I can. So this is what gets logged in the XML file. And as you can see, uh, way down here, well, maybe I'll just show you that. It is well formed. <laughs> you can bring it up in XML Spy, and uh, everything uh, uh, works really great. All right, let me show you the config. Uh, oh, that's the .NET config. That's boring. Let me show you uh, the config for how you configure trace listeners, including these. Um, it's always under system um, diagnostics, under sources. Um, the switches you don't need to worry about usually, but they usually default. But the listeners here, you can see I'm removing the default listener, which is the uh, one that goes into Visual Studio Debugger. You know, in most applications, you don't need that running. <laughs> so I just turned it off just to be uh, good about that stuff. Um, and here I'm, I'm saying I want to add the event log listener. This is essentially just telling these to turn on when your application starts up. Okay. And I have my XML trace listener. And in this one, I'm not using my email trace listener because I don't know if these talks, if I have any email going on. So I usually turn that off. And here's my web service trace listener. So the configuration is down here. So here's my XML um, configuration for the listener itself. I'm adding the XML writer, which is actually in this name, in um, this namespace. And this is the name of the uh, XML trace listener, called XML trace listener. Also, uh, have a flag in here. Remember those supported attributes uh, method that I showed you before? I have my own parameters that I can set up in my um, trace listener. So here I'm saying if you want to do back, um, backups, and here I'm saying um, how many days to keep them. Okay? I'm not going to show you the event log. There's really nothing going on in that one. Um, the email uh, one is pretty easy. The same thing using the email trace listener. But then here, I'm actually setting up the to address, from address, subject line, uh, and SMTP court port to use for sending out the email. And then I told you that uh, these are only do criticals. So here's how you create a filter. You just stick a filter in here. It's an event type filter. And then you just, um, the initialized data actually is the severity. Um, the web service trace listener, not much different, really, except I have the service path, the name of the, where the service actually is. I'm using just XML web services and, uh, and the name of the, um, the service name and the method name. So that's all you have to do to set up those trace listeners. As you can see, it's very, very easy. And if someone calls and they want me to turn on the email trace listener, I unremark this, save it, and in ASP.NET, your app automatically restarts or have your user restart their application. And those will automatically be turned back on. Hi! <laughs> Those speakers set up. Okay, so um, the next thing now is now you're logging your, your events and exceptions, right? But most times, where are you logging it to? User's machine, 
Huh? Where? Yeah, but that's on the user's machine. That's not very easy to uh, look at, right? Um, especially if you have thousands of users like we do all throughout the country. It's very hard. And also with the servers, whoever's got the multi-servers, I actually started writing uh, Enhance this system when I worked at a really big uh, uh, web commerce company. We had 15, at that time we had 15 back-end servers. And we never, we knew errors were happening, but we didn't know where it was happening, right? So I devised a central, log, a central logging system. The problem is basically each client server logs locally in most cases, right? Not a good idea. As you can see here, we have servers, we have machines and files all over the place. Support has to log on to many machines to read them. Um, they don't like that. And there's really no searching capability. So if you wanted to search throughout everything that's happening in all your servers and all your customers, it's not very easy to do if you just log the machines, right? So this typically makes sense. I think someone's doing this already. Who's logging to a database? You? You two? Yeah. Three? Four? So that's why you're doing it, right? To get all in one central place. So the solution, of course, is a centralized error logging system, which I have, um, you know, wherever your program's running, then um, uh, logs to the web service trace listener, right? Because this is the easiest way to get it from one place to another. Um, writes, the, uh, uh, writes the web service that stores the um, information in SQL Server. Of course, you could swap this out for anything you want. And then you could search and view for events and things like that in an ASP.NET app I wrote. I'm going to show you that. So I, th I didn't show you the other demo. Let's me to show you the other demo real quick. This demo is how to use just the log entry class itself. Um, remember before we were doing a, a, log, e a log event or log exception? Well, you can actually use the log entry class. Uh, so here I'm putting in a message. I'm setting the event, the category, which I told you guys we use a lot at work for um, different things. I'm setting the source, which I don't really need to do anymore. I'm setting a title, so you can actually have a title easier to search things on. And I'm also logging the virtual memory. And then I just do log uh, write entry, and I will log that information. This is usually what I'm use, uh, doing to log a lot of information during an event. And I use this uh, currently in an app, a WCF application I'm, I'm using. If anybody's done um, message inspectors, anybody do that in WCF? No, but I use this internally with the message inspectors to log all kinds of information about the WCF calls coming in and out of my servers. Like I'm logging the actual message size coming in on my, into my WCF service and the message size going out. And here's one where it's basically the same thing, but I'm just doing an exception. So here's my page that comes up. By default, it will show you uh, everything. So here, you know, I have my timestamp, my severity, my category. Um, my message, my machine name, source name, and username. Okay, so you can. This is the default page that comes up, and you can you can go down here and page through your exceptions, things like that. I can just go in here; it'll list all the servers that have been logged in the database. Uh, so I can go to uh, my my work machine, <laughs> and so on. I can see the the, the uh, messages just for that. I can actually uh, search by uh, severity, of course, uh, error information. This only shows you the ones that are logged, not all of them. So if you find one uh, you want to look at more, you can click on here. It'll take you to the details page. And here in the details page, here's that normal information at the top, like just like if you saw at the top of the log. Here are my error messages. And if there's more, hold on just a sec. And here's all that um, additional information that I wrote right there, sorted. So summary, please trace listeners to me are the easiest way to do it. They're built into .NET. They overcome a lot of issues. Um, please use some kind of uh, centralized error logging system. If not mine, then something you guys have at work. And then if you want to look into uh, other ways of logging your uh, exceptions and events, you can look at the enterprise library, which I think uh, this gentleman uses, uh, which is something that Microsoft does. I just didn't use that because there's a lot of things in there I don't want. Pick up a copy of my book. I'd appreciate it. And thank you. See you next year.